The rituals you can do to conjure demons, conjure spirits to do things for you or give you information or do different things. And yeah, I did all that stuff. Man. I was, I'm a very extreme person, so I kind of just got into the darkest stuff I could find. Um, My name is Jonathan Allen, and this is my story. Well, I had a pretty happy childhood. Um, I had my natural father, but I was adopted by my um, adoptive mother when I was about six, seven years old, and didn't have any contact with my biological mother, so I didn't know a whole lot about her. But my life with my two parents was very happy. We didn't grow up in a religious house, we didn't go to church, we didn't do, but we still had a very loving, it was a good time. And then when I was about 13 years old, there was a neighbor guy who was probably about 17 that befriended me, and he got me into heavy metal like Iron Maiden and Venom and all this like dark, satanic kind of heavy metal stuff when I was about 13 years old, and he got me into smoking pot and hanging out, so I was hanging out with these older kids that were into all that, and so it kind of just, I don't know, my parents didn't like it at all, um, it really caused a lot of friction, but that's just kind of where my life was heading. And then when I was about 17 years old, I ended up running away from home to San Francisco, California without telling anybody where I was going, my parents or nobody. And I was gone for months. My parents had hired detectives looking for me. I had pictures of me in Walmart on those boards. But what would have happened is I had a psychotic break at 17. So they put me in a mental institution when I was about 17 years old. And they diagnosed me with schizophrenia. So my life kind of stopped right there, and that was about, um, I thought I was never going to be able to do anything. You know, I thought I didn't know much about the illness, but the way they were talking to doctors was this was going to affect my life. When I was about 18, 19 years old, I met some people who were in the goth kind of thing and going to goth clubs and hanging out, and they accepted me right away. They thought it was actually kind of cool that I was mentally ill. so. I got accepted by them, so I joined in with them, and that's when I met my wife and became friends with her, was in that um, goth scene, goth club scene. Things kept getting darker and darker and darker, and um, I ended up getting into black magic, like Egyptian magic and Satanism. And There's a couple kinds of Satanists. There's theistic Satanists, and there is atheistic Satanists. Atheistic Satanism, believes that you're God, and I don't know why they call themselves Satanists, because they don't worship Satan, they worship themselves. I was more into the theistic, like he was a real spiritual being that I thought you know, could give me power and give me influence and give me things I desired. You know what I mean? I felt like reaching out to Satan was the way, you know, because the Bible talks about not going after the flesh, but going after the spirit. When you're a Satanist, it's all about the flesh. And you go after, I mean, you really, I mean, it's kind of like just, you take Christianity and flip it on its head, and you, you know what I mean? It just, um, when, and we worship th Satan as like a theistic, uh, like a God. And we, you know what I mean? And we thought he was telling us the truth, and that God was a puppeteer just laughing at us, putting us on the earth to be miserable and be hurt. And me ending up with schizophrenia, I latched on to it because I believed it. I was like, well, why would God, if he loved us, make me schizophrenic? What did I do? You know what I mean? I just, I can imagine, and other people I met in the mental health system who were schizophrenic or bipolar, how much they suffered. I couldn't see how a loving God would do that to somebody. When they, you know what I mean? So I, I, to, I thought, well, no, Satan is the one telling us the truth. Satan is the one that wants us to be free from guilt, free from shame, because we get allowed to do the things of the flesh without feeling bad about it. So, you know what I mean? So it kind of, it's just a perverted sense of salvation, in a way. I had really latched on to the Satanism and um, just like magic and all that stuff. Uh, I ended up getting tons of tattoos. My arms are covered in satanic tattoos and Egyptian magic and stuff. I'm a very extreme person, so I kind of just got into the darkest stuff I could find. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure how real most of that stuff is. I know from reading the Bible that it is real, or God wouldn't tell us to stay away from it. You know, so 2017, I was on my way to Missouri for a family reunion type thing. On the way there, I was reading my black magic books, like Master Crowley books. I ended up getting to the family reunion, and my aunt pulls me aside, and she's like, 
talking about about Jesus, and I told I don't want to hear it. There's no Jesus. I mean, and if there is a Jesus, I'm more powerful than Jesus. Jesus can't do nothing. You know what I mean? He died on the cross. He failed. And that's what I was telling her. And she kind of just started laughing at me. Like, I'm like, why are you laughing? She's like, because you sound ridiculous. She's like, you know what I mean? That's like cheering on a football team who just lost the Super Bowl. I mean, you don't, I mean, it's, it's the same thing with worshiping with Satan that my aunt was laughing about is why would you worship somebody that just has already lost? Somebody who's, you're, you're, you're it, it seems ridiculous to her. She thought it was ridiculous. So she said, just go into a church and see what happens. Just go into church and see what happens. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, well, if you're more powerful than Jesus, you're more powerful than God, you're more powerful, just go into a church. You shouldn't be scared of it if you're more powerful, then just go. So I was like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. So I told her, I said, I'm going to find the most spiritual church I can find that'll make this look, you know, all come out looking really good. So I picked a Pentecostal church. And if you know, Pentecostals are spirit filled. They believe in the spirit. I mean, I got there and I thought it was ridiculous. I thought these people were, were acting silly. You know, I, 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 did a, you know, I didn't take much stock into it. And the pastor said, is there anybody, we're doing, he did an altar call. Anybody want to come to the altar and pray or whatever? And I was like, yeah, God, I'm going to show you all that God has no power over me at all. I'm going to go to the altar, and I'm going to stand there, and I'm going to show you that God can't do nothing to you. I went up to the altar, and I stood there for about two or three minutes, and all of a sudden, I fell to my knees, like something knocked me down on my knees. And this is the craziest thing. I just... All of a sudden, it felt like somebody wrapped, wrapped their arms around me, and I spun around, there's nobody behind me. And I'm like, oh, what the heck was that? Like, I think I need to take more of my pills because my schizophrenia is kicking in. And, you know, like, I thought, I need, and by, by this time, my illness had been pretty stable. And all of a sudden, it felt like part of me just got ripped out of my body. Like, it was weird. It felt like something in me like, it, it, it just felt like part of me just left. It was weird. The weirdest feeling in the world. It felt almost like I thought I was going to die. I thought maybe I was dying and I was leaving my body. I, it was weird. And all of a sudden, I felt all of this love that I had never felt before ever. Love and all of a sudden, all the turmoil in me left and I felt peace. And at that time, I just started bawling and crying and sobbing. I uncontrollably, I could not stop crying. And I felt somebody wrap their arms around me again. And I just let it hang there for a minute. And I looked around and there was nobody there again. And I just kept crying. And I said, I, and God told me, I'm gonna use you. I'm gonna use you. And I told him, I said, I said, who, what you, who you know, basically like, Paul, who are you, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm Jesus, I'm God. You are, you're gonna stop this right now. And I told him, I said, okay. I said, you must be real because I said, I came in here with one mindset and now I'm at a completely different mindset. It's weird, like something in me completely shifted. I mean, this is, this is, when you talk about doing a 180, I mean, that's a 180. And I told him, I said, I said, I don't know what I need to pray about or what I need to say to you, but I, I, I'll accept you. I said, I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord. And, I said, you're obviously real, and I said, I was wrong, and I was like weird because all this stuff got exposed to me that was wrong that before I thought was right, and it, it was weird. All, every single um, thing, all, like my bearing on what's right and wrong completely changed in an instant, like from, I thought this was right and this was wrong, no, now this is what's wrong, and it was weird, it was like a complete shift. And I remember my wife knows when I came home from that church service, she, I walked in the door and she was like, uh-oh, what'd they do to you? Like, <laughs> she could tell like right away, like they did something, to, what'd they do to you? You know, you don't look right. She, she, she knew right then that something in me had changed. And so right then I, I went and got a Bible right away and started going through the Bible, just going through stuff. I decided like right away, I need to be filled with the Spirit. I need, I need to be, so I called, the church that I was going to, and I asked him, I said, what's the deal with the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What's the deal? And he said, well, he said, we believe that Jesus can baptize you in the Holy Spirit anywhere. You don't need to do it in a church service. You don't need to do this. He said, he can do it anywhere. I said, yeah, but I want it. I said, and I said, can, you, can we pray about it? Like after church, we could pray about it on a day that's off and we can, you know, I want to receive that. 
That Wednesday, after I got saved, the pastor called me up front, surprised me. Uh, he called me up front. I didn't think they were going to do that. And I was like, oh, no, what? So I went up there, and him and another pastor put their hands on me and started praying. Right, right away, it felt like, like you know, I don't know, it's like lightning hitting or something. My whole entire body felt like, I mean, if you've ever been zapped by electricity, I mean, when I was a kid, I grabbed onto an electric fence one time, and got zapped. That's what it felt like all over my body. And all of a sudden, I, it was almost like I blacked out for like an instant. And then when I came to realize what was happening, I was speaking in tongues. They had all seen what I looked like coming in. I mean, I had long black hair. I mean, you should see my ID. I still have my old ID with my ID picture of what I looked like that day. You know, and then after that, things just got better and better and better with God. I, I really relate with the Apostle Paul a lot and uh, some of the Apostles, just like how he was on his way to Damascus thinking that these Christians were a bunch of, yeah, right, I'm going to go destroy them all, thinking he was on, and then God knocked him on his face and said, no, you're not, I'm going to use you now. You know what I mean? That's kind of like the same thing that happened to me. And God just, he told me, he, I'm going to use you, you're mine now. That's what he told me when I went to that altar. That's all he wanted me to do. He just wanted to get me up to that altar. You know, because he knew the place I was in. And he knew how much power he had over the power that I was following. And, you know, my family's in church with me now. Hallelujah. You know, and I want to reach out to people in a way where they cannot deny God. That's my heart. If, if I can be a testimony to anybody or an influence on anybody or anything, I, I hope so. Because, you know, I just, you know, our time is, it's coming, man. It's coming. Jesus is coming back. He gave us these gifts and these abilities and stuff through the Holy Spirit. You know, people go to rock concerts and they go and they, you know, go to sports events and they're going wild. They're going nuts. And they come to church and it's like, that's way, church is way better than some sporting event. So I go crazy. I just, I, you know, and like, I think it is from where God brought me from. I wasn't born into it. I wasn't, you know, it was, this was not just a flow of things for me. This is, you know, this is 100% all my heart. And yeah, if I'm up there worshiping, Pastor Mike is jamming out, I'm going to, you know, like, you know, and when Pastor Josh preaches and he's filled with the Holy Spirit, acknowledge he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Cheer, get the Holy Spirit pumping in him. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah, I, I just have this excitement in me for God. Like, I don't know. Like, when he comes in those clouds, I'm not, I'm gonna be jumping up and down dancing. <laughs> king David, he's the guy to go to when he wants to see how to worship is King David. What did he do in Samuel, the Book of Samuel? He leaped and danced before the Lord, and his wife looked at him with badly. So who cares if somebody looks at you badly? You get out there and leap and dance just like King David before the Lord. Because this is about God being worshipped. It's not about what other people think about how you worship God. Because God doesn't care what those people are thinking. He's watching you worship Him. He's watching you worship Him. And if people are looking badly at you for that, who cares? Who cares? I mean, I won't. I'll join you. We'll dance together.